As USS Saratoga approached San Diego Harbor on December 7, 1941, to embark her air group, the Japanese launched an attack on Pearl Harbor. By the next morning, Saratoga had become the flagship of Carrier Division 1, immediately departing for the Hawaiian port. The Japanese had also launched a series of assaults throughout the Pacific, taking the United States forces by storm. Still, the handful of men stranded on the tiny atoll known as Wake Island miraculously repelled the initial strike. They were now waiting for a final blow. Saratoga and her fleet soon steamed towards Wake Island to relieve the few military elements and civilian workers there, needing to travel about half the immense ocean to get there on time. However, the weather conditions, the need to refuel, and the intense enemy activities in the region kept delaying their advance, leaving the brave men on the island to fend off on their own. Middle of nowhere. A small and lonely island lies about 2,000 miles west of Hawaii, just halfway to Japan. The tiny atoll, comprising the Wilkes, Peel, and Wake coral islets, struck 19th century American naval planners as an ideal site for an advanced defensive outpost in the middle of the vast Pacific. However, it wasn't until early 1941 that a consortium of civilian firms officially began the construction of proper military facilities on the atoll. The greedy empire soon put its sights on Wake Island due to its proximity to the Japanese-occupied Marshall Islands. If the atoll was seized, they would acquire a strategic 2.85 square mile piece of land in the middle of the ocean that was inches closer to the United States. When the Japanese finally struck, construction workers hadn't completed their work on the island and only 449 U.S. Marines, several dozen Navy personnel, a handful of Army radio operators, and 1,100 civilian workers were there to defend the strategic land from the highly trained enemy. In fact, several American strategists reckoned that the garrison was roughly 2,100 men short of what was required to have a chance against the Japanese troops. The island defenses also included six 5-inch coastal artillery pieces, 12 3-inch anti-aircraft guns, 12 F-4F Wildcat fighters, and a limited assortment of machine guns and small arms, while the garrison was complemented by 45 Guanamanian men employed by Pan American Airways as part of its Trans-Pacific Clipper service. On December 7th, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and the improvised stronghold knew they were coming for them very soon. Against all odds, The Japanese first struck Wake Island on December 8th at noon. Although the defenders had received word of the attack on the Hawaiian port hours earlier, they were not prepared for the incoming assault. Lacking radar facilities, not to mention the heavy cloud cover that prevented all visibility, the Americans failed to respond with force. A raid of enemy fighters soon came in from the Roy Namur Air Base on the Marshalls and caught the bulk of the island's fighter squadron on the ground. They destroyed all the Wildcats parked along the runway and only four airborne models survived. As the ground personnel lost two-thirds of its members, hundreds of civilian workers rose to the occasion and supported the troops, either on the battlefield or carrying out building tasks and delivering supplies. Meanwhile, the American submarines Tambor and Triton were deployed to provide early warning. Three days later, the Japanese naval task force approached the island's south shore. The fleet consisted of the Yubari, Tenryu, and Tatsuda light cruisers, the Ayoi, Mitsuki, Kisaragi, Hayate, Mochizuki, and Oite destroyers, two armed merchantmen, and two patrol boats with 450 Special Naval Landing Force troops. Furthermore, three submarines secured the perimeter. Assuming the Americans had been devastated by three days of bombardment, Rear Admiral Sadamichi Kajioka approached the island head-on. However, the persevering defenders would not yield and unbeknownst to the invaders, they had secured the naval guns from the old battleship USS Texas and still had four Wildcats to help them hold their ground. The enemy. The invading forces ran parallel to the southern shore, conducting bombardments along the coast. Still, they remained out of range of Battery A on the southwestern tip. As the sun came out, flagship Yubari turned to face the island and closed in. 
the Americans then opened fire, getting the cruiser on the port side. Forced to retreat, the flagship and the stunned admiral steamed away, leaving a trail of thick smoke behind as two patrol ships offered cover under a smokescreen. Nevertheless, the cruiser received many more damaging hits. Meanwhile, on the atoll's eastern tip, Major P.S. Devereaux ordered his gunners to hold their fire until the enemy moved within range of Battery L on Peel Islet. Then, at a distance of 4,000 yards, the 5-inch coast defense guns opened fire and hit Hayate directly on her magazine twice. The destroyer immediately split in two and did not take long to sink with all hands. Hayate was the first Japanese surface vessel officially sunk by the U.S. Navy during the conflict. Oite began to retreat after the encounter, but she was severely damaged by 50 caliber machine gun fire. Her accompanying ships followed, and they too endured heavy barrages as they sailed away. At the same time, Battery B repelled Kisaragi, Yayoi, and Mutsuki on the northern tip with the help of the remaining Wildcats. Withdrawal Taken aback by the unexpected resistance, the Japanese forces soon began to withdraw, but as the ships turned around, one of the Wildcats dropped a bomb on top of Kisaragi. The bomb landed among a pile of depth charges, which set the vessel ablaze. She then disintegrated in a huge blast that dragged her to the bottom of the ocean. Kajioka was humbled by the otherwise small engagement, which was the Japanese Navy's first tactical defeat in World War II. Moreover, it was the only amphibious landing to be repelled by shore guns in the entire conflict. Meanwhile, the American people back home were electrified, as the victory had dispelled much of the gloom caused by the attack three days before. But for the handful of Marines, sailors, soldiers, and civilians stranded on Wake Island, the battle was far from over, and help was thousands of miles away. Second Try Having endured tremendous casualties, the Japanese Rear Admiral was compelled to ask for reinforcements to the very fleet that had attacked Pearl Harbor. Meanwhile, the U.S. Navy was stretched thin in the Pacific, and the closest naval support was on the California coast and not on the Hawaiian base anymore. Still, a relief force for both Pearl Harbor and Wake Island was put together, with the USS Saratoga aircraft carrier as the centerpiece, but it would take Task Force 14 too much time to cover half of the Pacific. Thus, Task Force 11 was diverted to aid in the effort, as many undisclosed enemy aircraft carriers roamed the surroundings of the Marshall Islands. While the reinforcements arrived, the Americans on Wake Island endured two weeks of daily bombardments, as the Japanese had significantly bolstered their invasion fleet by then. Fresh from the recent assault on Hawaii came the carriers Soryu and Hiryu, and their escorts, the destroyers Tanikaze and Urakaze, and the heavy cruisers Kinugasa, Aoba, Kako, and Furutaka. In addition, many other vessels from the invasion of Guam and the Gilbert Islands joined Kajioka. On December 21st, the Japanese launched a second attack. They first launched carrier-based aerial strikes to stun the defenders, and the four brave Wildcats could not stand the force of roughly 50 bombers and fighters. The American aircraft were damaged beyond repair, but not before shooting down an impressive 21 enemy warplanes. With the Japanese carriers involved, the American relief forces were ordered back to the safety of Pearl Harbor, as they couldn't risk engaging a much superior force. Thus, the garrison on Wake Island was abandoned to its fate. Last Stand At midnight on December 22nd, several lookouts identified irregular flashes on the horizon. Kajioka's reinforced fleet had arrived. The Japanese soon got their landing forces on the ground, whereupon they could take out the island's defenses. A massive task force of 2,000 troops then harassed the atoll, and before dawn on December 23rd, 900 Japanese men stormed ashore and joined them. The fighting was fierce and desperate, but after a few hours of close infantry combat, the outnumbered defenders saw no other choice but to surrender. The Americans were defeated, but it came at a great cost for the Japanese Navy. In exchange for their position, the Japanese lost two destroyers and no less than a thousand lives. In contrast, 
the defenders lost only a hundred men between Americans and Guanamanians. Those who survived became prisoners of war, while most were evacuated to China and Japan. Still, about a hundred workers were kept as forced labor. The Japanese held Wake Island for the duration of the Pacific War, with a garrison of over 4,000 troops and several erected fortifications. Meanwhile, the U.S. military never attempted to retake the atoll, but cut the island's supply lines at one point and executed periodic naval bombardments and air raids. It wasn't until two days after Japan formally surrendered to General Douglas MacArthur's troops aboard the battleship USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay on September 2, 1945, that the Japanese forces on Wake Island finally lowered their flag. Thank you for watching our video. Don't hesitate to subscribe to all of our Dark Documentaries channels for more history and military inspired content. And click on the bell icon to be notified of our newest videos. Stay tuned.